create their own little soul, these cars. They all have their own story. Automobiles are a way in. It's a way to get into an era that I can't personally experience. I wasn't alive in 1965. I just like building things that I can figure out how to drive. It's grown into a passion. It's kind of my purpose in life is just to kind of help uh, bring awareness to the hobby and to Studebaker specifically. I just like being around old cars. It's the history that is really interesting. It's not just the cars itself, the time caps. It's also the literature, how they were marketed. It was an attitude. You've made it. And this is the type of vehicle a person has. I'm Jeff Shively. I am the Director of Development for the Kokomo Automotive Museum. I also am the editor for the Cadillac LaSalle self-starter, so I'm a, an automotive journalist and historian as well as being a museum uh, employee. Yes, well the Indiana Automobile, the, the history of it begins really in 1893 when a gentleman named Elwood Haynes in Kokomo decided he needed a better way to get to the gas fields. So of course he contracted the Apperson brothers, Elmer and Edgar, who had a machine shop in Kokomo, to help him build this machine, which of course he tested July 4th, 1894. Well, Elwood Haynes was different than a lot of your other pioneers in the auto industry. A lot of them were skilled craftsmen, but Haynes was college, he was college educated. He was a, a meddler just by trade. These early guys were going back trying to solve the fundamental problems of how to make things work. Today, when you build an automobile, it's pretty much cut and dried, but back then, Mr. Haynes was trying to find a way to get around that. And again, being a metallurgist and being a scientist, that certainly was a big factor in it. My name is Jeff Griffin. I drive a 1922 Haynes Tourister, model 75. The Tourister model, there are only currently three known to exist. One other one happens to be in Kokomo, the other one happens to be in California. My car originally was built here in Kokomo and a gentleman here in the early 80s purchased the car and brought it back to Kokomo. His uh, children decided they didn't want the car and he asked me if I wanted to take care of it and I told him yes, jumped at a chance. I'd already previously owned two other Haynes automobiles at the time. So I undertook the task of restoring the car. My name is Dan DeThomas and the car is a 1925 Stutz Series 693 Roadster. And all these cars, old cars, have a story. This particular car was sold originally in Steubenville, Ohio at the Pietro de Novo dealership. I had been there a couple summers working when I was a teenager. So we saw, the, I knew the car and uh, when the dealership was getting ready to close, this car was there. So we bought the car, my wife and I, from the dealership that sold it originally. Well, of course, the Stutz automobile has a uh, inextricably linked to the Indianapolis 500. Harry Stutz set out to build a car to compete in the Indy 500, and they built high-performance cars. They were fast, they were sexy, they were just full of power. And that's what Stutz, there was luxury and power. As the company went along into the 1920s, Harry Stutz lost control of the company. He eventually goes off and starts another company called HCS after his company is, is, is basically taken over. Of course, Auburn, Indiana has a great story too. Um, the Auburn Auto Wheel Company traced, traced its origins back before the turn of the 20th century. The Eckerd brothers were building carriages in, in Auburn. And of course, if you look at the grill on your 1920s and 30s Auburns, it always says, established 1900. Well, that's not quite. They were building carriages then. My name is Frank Fusick. I'm in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And my car behind me is a 1931 Auburn four-door sedan. It's an 898, which is the designation for the model year. And it's an A, which is the custom model, which would have a few more amenities rather than the standard would have. We found the car in Portland, Oregon. We found it because we, we took the Auto Court Duesenberg Club roster 
and look for anybody with a five passenger or, or sedan and wrote them all a letter and asked them whether they were interested in either selling their car or whether they were interested in knew somebody who had one for sale. And came up with six good potential people to take and talk to and ended up with this one because it was a sedan and it was very affordable because it needed lots of work. Auburn started life as a fairly utilitarian automobile. And then in uh, the mid-1920s, a guy named E.L. Cord came from Chicago. He was a financier, very young guy. He was about 30 years old at the time. And basically takes it to the Auburn Automobile Company. What he also does is he takes in an, a struggling concern from Indianapolis by, uh, owned by two brothers, Fred and August Duesenberg. Now, the Duesenbergs produced racing cars. That's how they got into the business, was with racing cars. And eventually they produced the Duesenberg Model J, which of course was the most powerful American car of the era. And with e, with E.L. Cord's marketing sense, he begins marketing automobiles. That's very important. In the mid-1920s, something happens. And what that something is, is the stylists and the advertising men get into the business. Before that, it was engineers designing cars. So they're all big boxes. But by the mid-20s, what Mr. Cord did to sell cars at Auburn, he painted them bright colors and gave them, you know, gave them nifty pinstriping and neat colors, and they started selling. So they were flamboyant. The car that Mr. Cord put his name on was very important technologically as well. He built, in 1929, the L29 Cord, which is the very first American front-wheel drive automobile as a passenger car. My name is Jack Laughlin, L-A-U-G-H-L-I-N. I've got a 1930 L29 Cord that was actually made just about 10 days before the stock market crash. I saw these cars, I said that would be the ultimate car I'd like to have, and things were going pretty good. Went to Hershey back in uh, about 94, saw this car sitting on a trailer with a bunch of boxes and crates and parts laying all around the trailer. So I started talking to the gentleman and it was well out of my price range. We exchanged addresses and everything. But about six, eight months later, I had a phone call. And the gentleman that owned the car wanted to sell it. So in about the middle of 95, I made him an offer that I didn't expect him to take. And a couple weeks later, he called me back and told me to come get the car. And that's how we became owners of L29 Cold. My name is Jack Rands and I own a 21 Marmon Model 34B Speedster. I'm fanatical over two-seater convertibles, so that's sort of where that all stemmed from. And after that, it was all happenstance uh, seeing the car owned by one of my clients, which I now own. He had this private collection that he had hid. I built his pool in the spring, went back that fall to close his swimming pool in this great big carriage house next door. So he opened the doors and there was the Marmon. That was in 1977. Uh, so I got to look at this car an awful lot. It was on my wish list for a long time. Well, well the, the Marmon automobile course is an Indianapolis company. Now most people if you if you ask them what a Marmon is they won't, uh, what's that? Well if I say, well what if Indianapolis 500? Oh. The, the car that won the first NF500 was the Marmon Wasp, which I think was a heavily modified Model 32. But Marmon, of course, obviously they, they, a derivation of the company was, of course, Marmon Harrington, which, of course, built, built four-wheel drives. So they've kind of survived beyond that. But again, a lot of these companies, again, like Auburn, I mentioned earlier, the uh, Marmon, uh, Stutz, the Great Depression, killed them off because there just wasn't as much call. There's only so many super rich people can afford a six, seven, eight, nine thousand dollar car in an era where a house costs five thousand. My name is Andrew Beckman. I am the archivist at the Studebaker National Museum. Well, the Studebaker Brothers Manufacturing Company was the world's largest manufacturer of wagons and buggies. Uh, they were worldwide. They were like the you know Coca-Cola or you know General Motors. They were the brand for uh, horse-drawn vehicles. Well, as uh, we get closer towards the 20th century, automobiles are starting to come you know, on the market. And you have to put yourself in the Studebaker Brothers position. You know, they are the leader of the horse-drawn vehicle market, and this newfangled contraption called the automobile is coming along. What are you going to do? Uh, so Studebaker really came down firmly on both sides of the issue. They continued building horse-drawn vehicles in South Bend, and they acquired companies who in turn uh, 
uh, built automobiles. Uh, they acquired the EMF company and the Garford company, and Studebaker essentially marketed these automobiles through their dealers, and that's how Studebaker entered the automobile market. My name is Tom Curtis. Right now I'm the national president of the Studebaker Drivers Club. I'm going into my third year as that. I'm the marketing committee chair. People uh, have a lot of different roles within the club, but uh, that's what I'm doing right now. I grew up with Studebakers, and w when you kind of grew up in this area, like at least in Elkhart, you know, we all had family that worked there. I discovered that we have a yellow 59 two-door wagon that I, I saw in the car corral at Auburn, Indiana many years ago. And I think it was 96 or 97. And I came around the corner and it was love at first sight. And, and uh, I, I really had to be totally reintroduced to Studebaker and that's where the love kind of developed then. I was born in 54, so I kind of grew up in the uh, model car period. I had an older brother who was a model car builder. And, you know, honestly, I think a lot of that disease, this car love came from him. And then I had a father, a very conservative father, that always had uncool cars. So it made it real easy uh, for us to uh, make fun of whatever my dad was driving and then build the cool models. This car I thought was pretty much complete. And after I got it home, I found out that um, one of the head gaskets was blowed. My son-in-law, luckily, is a paint and body man. So I sort of uh, commissioned him to help me get this car up and running. So I did the mechanics, and he painted everything you see that's black on this automobile. And then after that, it's down to details. When we got the car restoration going along, of course, everybody wanted to put color you going to paint it. I had a... 77 Corvette that we had driven for over 20 years. It was yellow, it was this color, and I really liked that color. I didn't paint it that color to stand out, I painted it that color because that's what I liked. And uh, I like it. So I worked with a, a restoration company in Covington, Ohio, that they were able to disassemble the car and do all the mechanical work, any fabrication work because you don't run down to the parts store and just pick up parts for this car. They have to be made. So uh, the process took well, about two years to be complete. The architecture, I call it the exterior architecture mostly, although there's interior architecture, but I just, that's what attracted me to Studebaker. There's just so many of their, they have a, a very keen sense of proportion. Their colors, interior and exterior, especially in the 50s, you know, they just had marvelous color combinations. They're, their 55 Speedster, the number one seller in 55 on the Speedster was the Lemon Lime. And uh, they just were not scared to uh, really get some bold colors out there in a world where no one did it. I had never worked on a car of this age, so we had to learn about it. We had challenges. The first challenge was the engine had a crack. Generator pieces were deteriorated. The wheels were in really bad shape. So we did what I've learned to come to call a preservation and minor restoration because we did no body work. We just polished the paint back up and made it a running safe car. And it was, it was a family project and my son who was still living in, at home at that time got involved with it also. So it was, it was really kind of a family involvement. So it was a nine year project from the point we brought it home to the point where it was finished although they're never really ever finished. There have been more than a few times that I wondered what I got myself into, but we, we survived all that. And now we have a great touring car. I got a job carrying groceries, and I'd saved up enough money to get my first car like two weeks after I turned 16. I don't know, I've just always been a car person. I, uh, they don't have to be new. I just like driving. I was born in 54, so I kind of grew up in the uh, model car period. I had an older brother who was a model car builder, and you know, honestly, I think a lot of that disease, this car love, came from him. And then I had a father, a very conservative father, that always had uncool cars. So it made it real easy uh, for us to uh, make fun of whatever my dad was driving and then build the cool models. 
Uh, I've always tinkered. I think it just came natural. Built my first go-kart probably when I was eight years old. I built my first bicycle probably when I was four. If I don't know how it works, I tear it apart. I've always had automobiles, cars, motorcycles, scooters, go-karts, but this Marmon fell in my lap and it became a new game for me. Yeah, yeah, I always had cars or some wheeled vehicle, motorcycle before driver's license. And my buddies and I, we always were car guys. And then there was a, a fellow that worked in the steel mill there, also had a, a body shop for a moonlight job. And we ended up hanging out up there. So I learned how to paint and do body work. And you get older and you get married and that kind of tapers off. And so it was good to get back into it. Uh, growing up in the Detroit area, it, uh, my father worked for the auto industry and he loved old cars and he would always tell me about his first car was a 1925 Model T. Whenever we could we went to car shows growing up and he enjoyed them probably a lot more than I did, but uh, that kind of rubbed off on me and I just like being around old cars. And... When I look at Indiana uh, automobiles, I think you can break it down into three things that they're most important for. Uh, number one is the innovation of performance. You have Studebaker, you have um, Auburn with their, their performance vehicles, the, uh, either the Studebaker Avanti, the Studebaker Hawk, or the Auburn Speedsters. That's one aspect. Another thing is engineering innovation. Elwood Haynes with the cast aluminum engine parts. That was revolutionary. Front wheel drive of the cord, you know, uh, supercharging. There's all you know, unit construction. There's a whole myriad of innovations that come out as far as with um, engineering. And of course, styling. Cord in the mid 1920s to sell Auburn starts painting them bright colors. And of course, hiring stylists to make them look good. Same with Studebaker. So those are trends, so I think those are the three things, the three legacies, performance, styling, and engineering. Driving a car can bring up a lot of different emotions. You're driving, especially around the streets of Kokomo, you're driving and thinking, well, these cars were all over the place. 90 years ago, and Haynes, it's a rather luxury car compared to what most people drove in the 20s. Uh, that car new cost about $2,400. A Model T at the time cost like $400. So there, it was not every man's car. It was, it was more for people with some means to drive it. it it's, it's fun to drive and and I like to go out and do it. I basically try to drive it year-round. Get a decent day, I'll take it out. So, you know, not unusual to see me out in January, February, March. She drives much better when you drive her more. So, it, it's good for the car to be out, and it's much more reliable just because it's, it's regularly driven. When you asked about passion about the cars, uh, the cars generate that passion themselves, I think. And most of them have a soul <laughs> that goes back. And um, this particular car was, was sold in Steubenville and was returned to Steubenville and we bought it from Steubenville. So it makes it an interesting story to tell people when they see the car. It's a habit you can't get away from. Once you start tinkering and you do, if you do hands-on, this actually becomes more passionate, I believe. I buy a car and get it running in order to drive it. And because of that, uh, I know every noise, every bump in the road. Um, it's, it's just a feeling you can't describe. It's just, it's, it is embedded in you, it really is. And I enjoy it. It's not an easy car to drive. Uh, a lot of weight in the front, uh, steering is heavy. Of course, you have to double clutch it. There were no synchronizers in the transmission. You gotta be, you, you gotta 
be on the ball and, and work at it to drive it, but it's very rewarding to drive also. It's a ton of fun, and especially living as close to South Bend because uh, our chapter, Michiana chapter of the Studebaker Drivers Club meets at the museum. So, you know, it's a great one Sunday every month for all of us, unless it's just terrible weather, to drive as many Studebakers as we can. So I get to enjoy them basically, you know, every day I'm in Indiana, I'm, I'm in this building. And uh, uh, it, it, it really is just something like being around family and friends. And like I said, they all have names. Uh, now I'm not over the board. I don't talk to them or anything like that. But uh, yeah, I enjoy looking at them. A lot of nice stuff. Indiana was the site of some of the greatest automobiles ever produced in this country, both from a styling standpoint, from a technical standpoint. If you look at the ingenuity, the talent, uh, the homegrown design uh, production elements that these cars were able to contribute to our automotive landscape, it's something every Hoosier uh, should just be very proud of. When people ask me about why does this matter, in Indiana, so much of the technology that we enjoy today, maybe you don't care about cars, that's fine. But you use an automobile, whether you rent an Uber or Lyft or whatever, or you bum a ride off of somebody, you are still traveling. You are traveling in a, in a vehicle that is warm in the winter, it is cool in the summer, you are dry, you will arrive at your destination in exactly the same condition you left your house. And you could actually pull out of your garage, never see the environment, pull into another garage, and you are in exactly the same state. And that's what all came out of Indiana from our technology. It was designed and built in Auburn, which is in our backyard. And this is one of the premium cars that was built in, in Indiana, along with the Duesenbergs and the Stutz and the Marmons and things like that. The head-on view of this L29 is what really got my attention. The overall design of them really trips, you know, really gets me. It trips my trigger, you might say. Marmons were unique at building things that actually ran well, so they prided themselves on their drivetrains and their engines. Uh, they made all their own components right here in Indianapolis. Marmon was ahead of their time on the racetrack as well as on the street. The making of cars, just like the Stutzes and the Auburns and the Duesenbergs and all these fanatical cars that were all basically hand built. That's the stuff that I like. It's just the, the idea of coming up with new ideas, really. This particular Stutz is the last remaining Roadster with dual side mounts and the Stutz in-house built engine. So that's the uniqueness of this particular car. And then I think you know, when you compare Stutz to Marmons and other Indiana cars, they stood out. And had it not been for these guys early on, these entrepreneurs doing these things in their garage or having a buggy factory and saying, well, I want to build a car. Yeah, if I was an Indiana resident, I'd be proud of that automotive history there. And I think a lot of people are. In the process of, of doing the restoration, restored it back to as it would have come off the factory floor. So we followed the Auburn Ford Duesenberg Club um, set of guidelines on, on what the car should, should ultimately be so we didn't over restore it. So it, it's been certified, it is as it, it should have been, um, and it's met, met the, the highest of the club standards as far as um, being judged. I really did it to drive it. The car industry in Indiana is larger than what people think Michigan is today. A lot of cars started in Indiana. It's interesting that you're in a small town in Indiana, central Indiana, and it's kind of the birthplace of a lot of the motoring that we do today. A lot of innovations were made here in Kokomo from uh, alloys used in cars, different uh, metals, to electronics started here in Kokomo. So that history of the automotive industry in Indiana has a real solid place in Kokomo. Uh, 
owning an older automobile, sometimes it's, it's a love-hate relationship because you just don't hop in and start driving like you do your current modern car. So they're fun to drive when they work right, but got to remember some of these cars are almost 100 years old and you just don't hop in sometimes and just run down the road. It takes a little work. When you asked about passion about the cars, uh, the cars generate that passion themselves, I think. And most of them have a soul <laughs> that goes back. And um, this particular car was, was sold in Steubenville and was returned to Steubenville and we bought it from Steubenville. So it makes it a interesting story to tell people when they see the car. Being in this field in uh, museum work, you could take all the vehicles away and it'd still be fascinating with the history, uh, the so many stories, how Studebaker's history is intertwined with our transportation history, with South Bend's history, with Indiana history. As a history enthusiast, as uh, someone with a Studebaker interest, it's just, you know, I, I come to work every day never knowing what the day will hold, but always know it's generally going to be something pretty interesting. I became a historian when I was eight years old. I uh, went to an air show in Columbus, Indiana, and I fell in love with World War II airplanes at that point. And automobiles are a way in. And as a historian, I've, I've got several degrees in history, and it's my passion, it's what I do for fun. It's a way to get into an era that I can't personally experience. It's not just the cars itself that are the time capsule. It's also the literature, how they were marketed, all that, everything around the automobile when you were selling a luxury car in that era, the way they did it was much different than today. It was an attitude. You've made it. And this is the type of vehicle a person who's made it has.